Hello and welcome back to Canberra Conversations. Today's conversation, I'm delighted to be joined by Dodge Woodall. Dodge is the founder and CEO of the Eventful Group, Born Mount Sevens, and the host of the Eventful Entrepreneur Podcast. Dodge, thanks for joining me. You're more than welcome, Colin. Nice to be here. Yes, and we're just laughing before we got started. We managed to avoid coming head to head against each other in the Europa League with, uh, at the time of recording, Rangers and West Ham doing their best in Europe for uh, British football, but we've... uh, We've got a couple of tough draws retrospectively. We have. You know what? I'd love I'd love to have gone up there as an, an away day up to Rangers with the West Ham lot. Yeah, it would have been unreal. We had uh, <laughs> we had uh, we had Dortmund in the stadium last night and they had three thousand fans and their fans were immense. They're great, aren't they? They're great. Yeah. Wall of noise, and um we really pride ourselves on an atmosphere. So uh, my my voice is a little bit hoarse after <laughs> good certainly, stuff. Certainly a good one. But but Dodge, I, I was I became acquainted with you a few months ago now and started binge listening your content and the eventful entrepreneur podcast was a podcast I enjoyed so much because like I've strived to do with this podcast, but you've done extremely successfully as you've had incredibly interesting guests, but you've also used the opportunity to have solo podcasts to tell your own story. And not only do you have great conversations with guests, but these solo podcasts really grip me. And I've found that from my own perspective, doing solo podcasts has meant that as a host, I've actually been better because I've not talked loads and loads about myself on episodes where I've maybe got an expert in another field on because it's not the temptation because I know I can tell my story on my own podcast at some point. Totally agree. Totally agree. I think there's a lot of podcasters out there who, who speak too much in their own podcast. And I'm, I'm on my own podcast. I'm just intrigued about people. And, you know, we're 71 or 72 episodes in at the moment um, and I just love chatting to people who've had eventful lives, whether you are a massive entrepreneur, whether you're a top businessman, whether you're a sporting icon, whether you're an ex-gangster, whether you've created a wonderful business, you know, I just, I'm just i intrigued on people's journeys. Yeah, and I think you do that really well. And I think, like you say, there is a danger sometimes as a host that you take over and you try and bring too much of your own story to the platform. But by yeah. having those solo episodes, it gives you that, space to tell your own story albeit you have your co-host that guides you through that as well which i think is really nicely done as well and that was what i really wanted to dive into with you today finding out where did the the eventful entrepreneur start well before he became what we would now call the eventful (laughs) entrepreneur what was the background story the 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 childhood the blocks the building blocks that formed the man that we get in front of us now yeah well i grew up in i grew up in london uh living above pubs all my life as a kid. So when you live above a pub, you grow up very quickly. You're around adults the whole time. um, And you see lots of stuff that kids shouldn't see. Um, But, you know, you grow up very quickly and you, um, you become streetwise very quickly. You know, we had a pub in London on the River Thames that mum and dad had, and we lived in a two bed flat above, above, above the pub. And next door we had a nightclub. So it was one little wall in between my bedroom and a nightclub that held 1500 people. So, I learned my entrepreneur spirit from a young age. And, you know, when, you, when you've got doorman on the door on Thursdays, Fridays and Saturdays, and you're a young kid in the 80s and you're getting protected and then taken up to the nightclubs all around different parts of London and at the age of sort of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, um, you end up, like you say, you end up sort of learning very quickly on, on personal skills and what works and what doesn't work and how you can earn money and how you can't earn money. And, and you start to read people, what their mannerisms and, and yeah, it all come from a very young age. What were your kind of first forays then? Because when I think of entrepreneur, I know there's so many different types of it, but you appear to be from that kind of generation of entrepreneur where it was like the kids selling sweets at school back to the other kids. What, what was that kind of first foray like for you where you were cutting your teeth in the entrepreneurial space? Yeah, well, I think everyone's story is selling sweets at school and panini stickers and stuff. But because I live next door to a nightclub, you know, I would go to the nightclub on a Saturday afternoon and speak to the manager and and get 20 tickets off him for a pound. And my dad's pub next door was a feeder club, feeder pub to the club. So everyone would stay there till 10.30. There'd be a thousand people in dad's pub and I'd go and get the tickets and sell them for two pound. But these tickets would get the customers queue jump in the queue. So everyone was winning. It was a win-win situation. So as a young kid, as a 10-year-old, I was coming out of £20. And it doesn't sound a lot now, but 20 quid in half an hour's work as a 10-year-old was a lot of money. So I thought I hit the jackpot. But it taught me those skills that, you know, always create a win-win situation in business. And that was just what, something I did every week. And 20 quid every week was a lot of money. 
Um, so that was actually inside the pub. And then at the back of the pub, we had a big WH Smith and they used to sell these massive toys. And if there's a little chink in a toy or something like that, they'd put these massive toys in these big wheelie bins. So me and my mate would go skip diving, it would hold onto my ankles and I'd go into the skip and pull out these great big toys and set up a little stand at the back of the pub because there was so much walk by trade, you know? So then, you know, you start to learn, you start to learn where you can earn money. And, you know, a massive thing again in linking it to the pub at the front of the pub, we'd, it was May Day, um, there'd be five, 6,000 people coming through, you know, to get down to the River Thames. And I'll set up a, a hot dog stand and an ice cream stand. And I'd go to Booker's, the sort of cash and carry, um, always or sort of always betting on my betting on the weather. And if it was sunny, I'd sell a load of ice creams. And if it wasn't sunny, I'd sell a load of hot dogs. And, you know, as a young kid, 11, 12, 13, I was kind of at 600 quid profit, you know, back in the 80s. And it all just, it all stemmed from there, really. And um, it just grew. It grew and grew and grew. And as I sort of went into my teenage years, I set up loads of other businesses and, uh, Roll on 30 years, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. You're relying on the weather, you're selling tickets, but at this time I'm selling tickets to 30,000 people at a festival. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's all been scaled up. It's been scaled up, but the, Absolutely. the beginnings of it were all these principles that you've just named there. So one of them being primarily understanding like a win-win situation for the customer, but of course for yourself and adding value through something that you can maybe take in or buy in in bulk or at a lower cost rate and then move on for a valuable price. So great business principles from the Absolutely. very start. We see quite often that entrepreneurial kids don't necessarily enjoy the traditional schooling system. What was that like for mm. you with somebody that's living this like very nightlife focused um, yeah. upbringing where you've got late nights, you're out in the pub, you're maybe living next door to the nightclub. I can't imagine there was lots of sleep on the weekends for you. No, there was no sleep. My sleep patterns all over the place. You know, we lived in a, a real vibrant pub and dad, dad was uh, the first one to take on doorman. They were called bouncers back in the day um, because it was such a, a, a pub that used to get copious amounts of people through the doors. And um my schooling was very different. I didn't really enjoy, I loved school because I was always mucking about in class. I was always disruptive and having fun and making people laugh. And, and, but I didn't, I found it very difficult to actually understand all the subjects and how to learn, learn in terms of, I was jumping into one lesson for history, then jumping into physics and then jumping into biology. It was all too confusing. It was like eight hours a day of jumping in Brown trying to learn this stuff. And I knew from a young age that I had something I knew from a young age that I was an entrepreneur and, you know, entrepreneur wasn't even, the word wasn't even spoken about back then. You know, it's not like now where it's the coolest thing ever. You know, back then, an entrepreneur was meant to be just for these top business people. But if you know how to earn a pound note, which I learned at a young age, it, it sort of, it made me realise that the schooling system for me was broken. And I, I recognised that at a young age. I recognised that people were just regurgitating stuff and it just being repeated in an exam and what have you. We're lucky these days we've got Google, you know, if I need to find something out, I can press a couple of buttons, I've got the information. But for me at school, it was all about playing sport. My main thing was sport. I was, I was fairly good at sport as a kid uh, across all the different sports. And that's what I used to just dream about. You know, I used to dream about playing for West Ham and scoring the, the FA Cup final winning goal. And, you know, and um, we're from a big sporting family as well. But yeah, growing up, I was kind of living a double life, really, because I was lucky uh, mum and dad working 24-7 in the pub that they, they they saved up enough cash to send me to a private school um, because the sporting facilities were amazing, the fixtures were amazing. That's why I really excelled on the sporting field. But I also knew that I had something, something special. I had something. I couldn't work out what it was. But, you know, when your mum and dad are seeing you earning that sort of money, going, where are you getting all this money from, you know? Well, mum, there's 400 kids at school, I'm earning a pound off, off all of them, you know, and it, it was kind of like that and it kind of grew over the years, but it was like a double life really because I was going to private school in the day, in the morning, dad was a bodybuilder and we used to have two Alsatians and we'd walk to school with my little West Ham rucksack in this posh little uniform, uh, dad there with his gold gyms, bot top and bottom and, and everyone else, all the other kids were getting dropped off by mum and dad in their Porsches and Rolls Royces and stuff. So it was, um, they were amazing times, amazing times, but it was like double life. So I'd come back from school and then I'd be in the whole life about earning a pound note, mingling with adults and seeing things I shouldn't see with a lot of 
naughty people who have gone on to written, write books and stuff now. And um, But I loved it. I I'm absolutely in- loved it. I'm interested, Dodge, that mum and dad is one of their values when they're thinking about where they spent the money. They spent it on your education. Yeah. How much value do you think you got from living the double life? So obviously, I think when people look at your story, there's loads of value from your experience in the pub, being a young businessman, being brilliant at speaking to people, and obviously being great at spotting a win-win situation. Yeah. How much did you gain from traditional education, or was it more a case of you getting exposure to to 400 people was your ideal situation? I was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. I was getting exposed to all these kids who had loads of money. <laughs> it, was like, it was a dream come true, if I'm honest with you. Uh, that went all the way up to the age of 18. But, you know, mum and dad were proper grafters. And mum's um, from Manchester, dad's from East London. Mum um, was a playboy bunny in the casinos in Mayfair. Dad was a croupier uh, before they went into the pub world. And... Yeah, they taught me wonderful values. And, and, and one thing they did give me as a kid was belief. And belief, as a dad now, is the biggest and best thing you could ever give to your child. Belief and encouragement. And I had that in, in abundance as a young kid. Um, and I was also taught to uh, respect my elders. And I was also taught to have respect and uh, be polite. You know, all these things that people take for granted or they're not really around as much today I had some real solid foundations from mum and dad Um, but growing up in a pub was amazing absolutely amazing and uh, just to throw it out there this is how wild it was we used to have two Alsatians and a Doberman and then upstairs in the flat we had a pet monkey we had a cockatoo called Bubbles because we're all West Ham fans We uh, we had a pet monkey called Mitzi this is God's on his truth um we had budgie regards we had you name it we had it dad should have lived on a farm but he was uh living above a boozer <laughs> i uh, i always prep for my guest dodge and i think about questions that i really want to go towards them with but your style is such that you just drop in little anecdotes and i keep thinking right i want to ask you about this but when did you learn to become such a good storyteller in terms of bringing all the different amazing experiences you've had over the years to the table now? Because I know up until a couple of years ago, you weren't sharing this at all. Were you, were you no. in person or was it, has it just become something you've grooved over the recent past? Well, I, I love people. I love people. I've been around people all my life. People's created my business. You know, I've selling over 1 million tickets to all my events over the last 20 odd years, you know? So I love people. And I've been around a lot of funny people, a lot of uh, people with charisma, a lot of, a lot of, I've, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. So I've got lots of stories and I've got lots of stories that I haven't told anyone before. And, you know, it's when pandemic hit a couple of years ago, I was like, everyone was saying to me, Dodge, why have you not told your story? I was like, no, I'm happy being private. I'm happy being private. Just le- let me be. And anyway, the, the, the staff were like, tell your story on a podcast and set yourself up an Instagram page and set yourself up on Facebook. And did, did. so I was like, okay, got nothing, nothing to lose here. There's nothing else to do in pandemic. So that's where it all sort of popped really. And, um, yeah, the, my, the, my last sort of uh, 22 months or 18 months or whatever have been, have been wild. And I haven't gone out there to say, oh, I'm a storyteller or whatever. I just tell people how it is and how it was. And I guess because it's such a, a different story to people, a different upbringing and, and the route I've gone down with festivals and, uh, and events and podcasting and, and, and what have you and in the middle of writing a book. And, you know, this is all new to me. But all I can be is me, and that seems to be working. So there's no sort of magic formula, if I'm honest with you, Colin. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, because sometimes I think, like, how much is nature, how much is nurture, and how much is like, been developed in terms of grooving the skill? But I think it, it's something that you have a natural flair for, because you've spoken to people for years and years and years, told stories, exchanged stories, bantered back and forth, listened to them come back to them and ultimately it just so happened that only recently you turned the mic on to record it absolutely absolutely and that's uh, and it's the best thing I've ever done in my business life I have to say because since a young kid I've always been curious you know I was the one in class always putting the hand up going excuse me can you explain that miss and all the kids would look at me go thank god he's I thank god dodge is asking that but a lot of kids wouldn't uh, wouldn't have the front front to do that and I still do it today you know, I'll be in business meetings now and someone's using jargon and going in, going into some sort of really meant to be some sort of clever zone. 
it's not clever zone of source. Let's keep it simple. And I'll be the one saying, excuse me, can you explain that? Can you make put that in Ron Seal terms for me? Bam, right, we're all on the same page. Now we can do a deal. Now we can do business. And it's about, you know, there's a lot of talk out there and, uh, and people overcomplicating stuff. There's no need to overcomplicate anything in business. Business is something I absolutely love. And I've combined my passion of business and sport and created a, a nice livelihood out of it over the last 25 years. And um, yeah, yeah, that's where, that's where I'm at. If I could take you back to post-school then, was it a consideration for you to always do further education or were you considering going full into the business and side of things? I went, I went from, um, from private school up to the age of 18 and I still didn't get the whole education thing. I knew I didn't get the education thing. But when I went out to the senior school, I had more kids there. And I was thinking, oh, God, this is amazing. When I finished 18, what's the next step? All of a sudden, because I was, I was good at sport, I went to Loughborough Sports University. All of a sudden, 12,000 people on campus. My eyes were like, ching I've got to go to this university. And, um, you know, luckily I got in there via the sports route because I didn't do A-levels. Um, and yeah, spent three years uh, doing PE sports science. I went and did a, uh, a year's travelling and did a rugby season in New Zealand. Within that period, I was playing at Wasps, Colts, and then, I, and then when I come back from my travels, I went to Leicester Tigers. And it's been incredible for your network to, to reach that because obviously we're going to get to the kind of massive event that you run now, which is very much rugby orientated. But it interests me that, like you say, you weren't that massively passionate about education, but yet again, you were like, well, it's a great environment for to be in. You probably made some great friends during that period. And you just continued to build up this business experience and these, these deals back and forth. And one of the things that I've heard you speak about before, and I'd love to learn a little bit more about it on, on a discussion like this, is the Ministry of Sound deal that you did would it be post university? What was what was that process like? Because that is pretty much even in this day and age, unbelievable that you managed to achieve that. Yeah, yeah. Well, my events world. Obviously, I've been in the events world for a long, long time, and my events world started at uni. So I really thank going to uni. I earned a lot of money at university pre events because I would I had this big sports campus, and I would go and get you know five hundred Adidas hoodies at 10 or a pop and sell them at 40 quid a pop on campus. It was just ridiculous, you know? So I did that in my first year, earned a hell of a lot, didn't go to any lectures, maybe one or two. Um, I, I just scraped through my exams with a 2-2, you know, like a 40, 50 percenter. Um, I wasn't bothered. I really wasn't bothered because I knew I was building something. And it was in my final year, start of my final year, I went to the local nightclub. But before I went to uni, my mum said to me, Dodge, Pound a man. Pound a man. That's all you need. Because there were so many there's so many students there. So in my final year, I was obviously one of the main faces on campus of being a rugby boy. You know, there's it was lots, it was a sports uni, everyone, everyone knew who you were. And I approached the local nightclub, which which would had a thousand students in there every Wednesday. It's a big sports night. And they were charging two quid to get in. And I went to the owner, I said, Yeah, I'll get I'll get everyone there in there earlier drinking on your bars. You keep your two quid, let's put a pound on top, I'll have a pound and you'll get more bar spend and I'll get more people through your doors and they agreed to it. So I guaranteed a thousand pound cash a week in 1999 as a student. And I built that nightclub to 2000 people every single week, every single, every single Wednesday. So as a student, I was coming out of two grand cash every Wednesday. And I also had a nightclub in, Luff in London as well on a Tuesday which gave me a grand a week. Again, taking, uh, driving down, taking the door money, paying all the expenses off and then driving back up. So as a student, I was on three grand a week for the whole of that year. Um, and that was my world. That was my world. And at that time I was thinking, there was no social media back then, remember in 99? There was no one would pay over with a card or what have you. It was, all, it was a cash game. So um, did that for, for the whole year. And then decided when in my final year, when I finished, it's like, right, I can, I can scale this business up, create a brand. Um, and in 2000, all the sort of dot-com boom happened. And I created a brand called popyourcherry.com, which was perfect for the students. 
Um, and what I did is I grabbed the, do you know the Pasha logo, the two cherries? Yeah. I grabbed that logo, tweaked it a little bit and used that as my logo and, um, and scaled up so I had 12 nightclubs every week across the country from Manchester to Brighton, to London, to Birmingham, to Leicester, to Bournemouth, to Exeter. And I'll take all the door money and the nightclubs will take all the bar money. And that's what I did for 10 years. And the capacity is really where between a thousand and 2,700 people every week now, in every club. Now, I guess it's incredible to see you, how you scaled that over time. And of course, the initial foray into it, it's crazy the amount of capital you would have had as a student. It would have been like quite intimidating, but you dealt with money from the age of 10 in terms yeah. of the, the hot dogs and the, the ice cream stall, the toys out the back. Yeah. How did you end up with the ball, so to speak, to pitch the Ministry of Sound event when you're running, albeit two successful nightclubs, London, Loughborough? Yeah. How do you make the step up to that? I, uh, I phoned up at the time back in 2000. It was um, Ministry of Sound was the biggest club and best club in the world. They had CDs, they had magazines, they, have a, they had a, a, a TV channel. They had everything, everything. I was like, right, I need that club. I need that club, you know? And I went to the club with my best mate, Chris, and um, I literally called that club and said, look, we want to do a student night here on a Thursday night when you're not open. And they wouldn't pick up the phone. They wouldn't answer me. They would, they would pick up the phone and then they would get blocked and I'd get blocked. I was like, look, I just want to hire your club. That's a student night. And they would just... They would just fob me off the whole time. So I literally phoned three, four, five, six times a day, every single day for like 21 days, leaving answer messages, leaving messages. Da, da, da. In the end, they were like, Jesus, put us, put, put them out of our misery. So anyway, we met, we met up with them and they come in with a, a higher fee and said, look, if you really want the club, it's 5,700 quid plus VAT. And I looked at my best mate, my partner at the time, business partner, grew up together, Chris from age four, I was like, that what's that you know it was literally like that but i said let's take the club and then we did sign the contract and away we went and that was that's what it was and yeah loved it in terms of persistence there was that some of the most resistance that you had to pursuing and progressing because previously it sounds like albeit things didn't come easy dodge but mm. it there wasn't that level of resistance and pushback against what you were trying to achieve because you said yeah. you went to the owner of the nightclub in Loughborough and you said I can create a win-win situation for you I'll get yeah. more students I'll get them in earlier you give me a pound a man I'm a yeah. happy boy but this yeah. time around somebody kind of put up the hand and said no we, we don't really want a student night at Ministry of Sound yeah. leave us alone yeah good question I haven't thought about that before but yeah you are right that was probably the most amount of resistance um I've ever had especially leading up to that age, at the age of early 20s. Yeah, 100%. But I'm a persistent person. And if you want something that bad and you're passionate about it and you become obsessive about it, you'll be a success in whatever you do. And I just wanted that nightclub at the time because I wasn't thinking about, oh, I'm putting it on my on my sort of uh, part of the profile. With the, but looking back now, it's a huge part of the profile because – people like yourselves are bringing up in conversation and whatever. And it's a, and it's a good fun story as well. You it know, we, did stands, London, it we called out. it the London student ball. Yeah. Well, it just stands out, Dodge, doesn't it? Because I think there's lots of people that go to university and run nights and nightclubs, albeit not on the scale that you ended up doing it with 12, 12 across the, across the country. But the reason that the ministry of sound stands out is because at, at that time it was the place to have a party. And yeah it wouldn't be something you would automatically associate with a Thursday night student night with cheap drinks and loads of students. So you, for you to run a, a, a ball is, um, it's, it's a bit of a different idea for, for a student night as well. It was, it was. And, and looking back, like you can press buttons now as a promoter, there's lots of promoters out there who can set up Facebook groups and Instagram groups and TikTok and press buttons while laying on their bed in their boxer shorts. Back then this was flyers and posters this is going around the country flyering and, and, and postering. And, you know, you, you might have like 100,000 flyers you need to get to hand. And if you couldn't get them to hand, no one would know about your event. So it was proper marketing back then. It's proper guerrilla marketing. And uh, you had to do what you had to do to let people know. Um, and that's what we did. 
Yeah, and I guess the reason I was asking about that persistence part was it's clear that you are a very motivated person, but I just identified that as a moment when I'm looking at your timeline as, okay, Dodge has faced a bit of pushback here, but actually he's overcome it. And it, that could have been a point where you maybe went back into your shell and you said, well, I'm going to stick to the kind of events that I've always done because I can't quite get this step. But yet again, it was just another step in the ladder towards what you've progressed towards now. It's a challenge. I love a challenge. Love a challenge. And it was a challenge. You know, they didn't want to know. But I wanted, I, wanted, I wanted a piece of the club. I wanted to be part of what they were doing. And, you know, at the time, ministry was so big, they could, they could say and do whatever they wanted and people would just obey. Or people would go, okay, fair enough, they don't want us. But, you know, I knew, I knew there was a great opportunity there. I knew we could throw an amazing party. I knew we could throw, you know, give an experience to people that they'd never had before. And that's what we did. And, you know, that really, again, was a, a lovely, looking back, it's a lovely thing. It's 20 odd years ago now. It's 22 years ago that was. But again, looking back, I've got fond memories. And if I could, if I could uh, bottle that feeling when you see that massive queue turning up, you know, to your event, and it was 35 quid a ticket back then to get into the club that night, 35 quid. And, and, and that's a lot of money. People, you know, it's a lot of money now. Um, but we did it and we smashed it. And it's, it's one of those things that I've got fond memories of. And if I could bottle that feeling, when you see that massive queue of people coming in and you're walking into a club and you're going, oh my God. And then you're seeing the club bouncing, you know, everyone having fun and loving it. And it was just, yeah, it was great. Absolutely great. I've spoken about this for a long, long time. So thanks yeah. for bringing this up. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying seeing your passion about it, Dodge, because you're passionate about lots of things, but you can see your face light up there. And yeah, you telling me about the feeling you get of seeing the queue is that when you know that the event's going to go to plan? Because obviously yeah. in advance, you've maybe sold lots of your tickets. And in this day and age, you're talking about a time where you were doing a lot of flyering, a lot of physical tickets. Rather than yeah. nowadays online, we'd all have our, our QR code and our, um, yeah. our you, would ha you would have had money paid via PayPal and credit cards and stuff in advance. In those days, maybe a little bit more worrying up until the minute it Absolutely. It, absolutely. It was cash. It was all cash. And that, that's, that's the way it was. There was no card card machines and there was no putting your card into a computer and buying 10 tickets for you and your friends. And, you know, it was people writing checks, you know, so it was, um, I wouldn't have it any other way. And, and anyone who says events is hard. Uh, it was hard back then because it was all the unknown. And I love the unknown now. But if you can't promote to 100,000 people pressing a few buttons these days and investing a bit of money in your marketing, there's a serious problem, you know? Yeah. And um, I, what, what's made me who I am today was going through that 10 years of marketing, of flyer and postering all around the country and building teams of people up in every city, you know? Because you had to have teams of people. You had to have 10 promoters on the floor, on the ground. You, had, you know, I couldn't be in 12 cities every week you know i had four parties on a monday four on a tuesday four on a uh wednesday you know whatever it may be you know so you couldn't be anywhere you couldn't be everywhere at once but it's about creating win-win situations and if you can create a brilliant fun night with an amazing experience for your customer they will come back the following week with all the success in the nightclub space and nightlife what caused you to pivot towards running an event like the Bournemouth Sevens? Another good question. <laughs> what made me flip over to starting a festival? It was, the, it was the, what made me, let me think. I guess it was, it was, it was a, quite a few things, in fact. One in two, you know, I launched the festival in 2008, but I, I, I'm always had this sort of, gut feeling of when things are time to move on or I'm always thinking five moves ahead in any business that I'm doing and I sent that nightclub world was going down a little bit because the late license um came into play I don't know how old you are but the late license back then was uh most people would go drinking at 7 p.m in all the pubs then they would leave the pubs at 10 30 and everyone go to the nightclubs all of a sudden late license come in and people and the pubs and the bars were putting little dance floors in their places to say, well, hold on, let's open our bar till 2 a.m. and we can hold everyone drinking in their place. So I kind of sensed that. And then there was a smoking ban come in in nightclubs. Now, smoking ban came in and it meant no one could have 
everyone had to leave the nightclub, step outside in the rain or the freezing cold and, and, and have a cigarette. So again, the experience was changing a little bit. And I, and, and I thought, you know what? I've done 30,000 miles a year going to all these clubs all around the country. I've put on 1,500 parties now in nightclubs across the country. Um, and at that time in my 20s, I was doing the nightclubs Monday to Thursday. Then I was coming back to London and then I was partying in nightclubs Friday and Saturday. <laughs> You know, so actually, when you look back, it I was in club six days a week, but um, and I wouldn't change it for the world, I really wouldn't. But that's when I started to sense things were changing in the nightclub world, and I thought, Do you know what, it's now time to step up and get into the festival world. There and that's what happened. External, there were kind of external forces were starting to make that market less fertile, and yeah, mm. and I was getting older. I was, I was, I was coming into my late twenties now, early thirties, and it was, you know. At the time when you're in your mid-20s, you're thinking, God, I'm going to do this the rest of my life. Yeah, of course I am. You get to a point where you're standing on the front door of a club and you're 30 years old and you're getting all students coming in at 18, 19, 20. You're starting to think, God, am I getting really a lot older here or are they getting younger? You ask those questions yourself. Even though you're taking great money because you're taking all the door money, which is wonderful. But it was time to, you know, I fell in love with, with my missus. We moved down to Bournemouth and it was time to just settle down and slow down. And as soon as I made that, choice that I was going to do a, uh, a festival I had all my Monday Tuesdays Wednesdays and Thursdays back and it was lovely and Friday and Saturday someone going partying as well so it, it was lovely it really was let's take you back to 2008 then when you're arranging the first Bournemouth Sevens festival what was the process <laughs> it was the unknown I didn't have a clue I did not have a clue when you're throwing uh, parties in clubs you turn up you bring thousands of people there you take the door money you put the dj on you have uh someone on the tills you have dancers up there you have the djs you have everything you that you bring to the table but everything's laid on a plate for you the toilets are there the security are there the bar staff are there the beer and all the stocks there you haven't got to worry about licensing or you haven't got to worry about police you haven't got to worry about anything that was all lovely then all of a sudden you decide to do a, a festival I'm going in hiring at 67 acres of green land. Didn't have a clue about police licensing, councils, fire brigade, the airport, which is next door to our festival, Bournemouth Airport. And I was entering a whole new world, a whole world, new world of sponsorship, a whole new world of, there was just, everything was, everything was just new, but I was naive. And naivety in business is the best thing you can have. It really is. And, and, and being naive um, allowed me to have the freedom, I guess, to create anything I wanted within that. But at the same time, I didn't have a clue about the figures and numbers. I didn't know how much marquees were. I didn't know about showers and toilets and fencing and... and, and uh, security costs and stuff like that. Security and police. And there were so many costs. And at the time... You know, I, I, it was six months prior to the first festival and, you know, it was myself. I didn't have a team of six or seven full-time staff or 10 full-time staff. It was myself. And I thought I could manage and do this, you know, to create a, a, a sport and music festival, which was unique. Um, there's lots of music festivals around the UK, but there wasn't a sport and music. So I wanted to combine all my contacts in the sporting world and the rugby world and what have you mixed in with knowing how to throw a great party, knowing how to promote and be good at marketing and creating brands. But that was a whole new world stepping into that. And yeah, it was uh, looking back, I tell people, you know, I mentor people now about entrepreneurship and events and what have you. And I always say, take calculated risks, take calculated risks. And uh, that was not calculated. That was a literal crazy, crazy risk. And um, yeah, we were, we ran out of money six months prior to the first festival. I didn't know people wanted money up front. Marquee company, 100 grand. Uh, toilets and showers, 15, 20 grand. Security wanted their 60 grand. You know, all these figures and were what they wanted up front because I, I had no track record, yeah. you know, of putting on a festival. So we had, you had to have that horrible conversation with your, with your fiancé at the time with a nice home, and it was literally like, we need to remortgage the house. And um, that's a really, really tough conversation to have your other half. 
you know, because we've spent the money up front. We had six months prior, prior uh, six months to go to the first festival and we needed more money. And in 2008, there was obviously the, the world crashed, financial world crashed. No banks were around, no sponsor. You know, it, it was it was really, really tough. And we made the decision to remortgage the house and uh, went for it. What were your selling points, Dodge? You're a good salesperson. How did you manage to sell it to your fiance? Uh, I was just honest. I was straight, like I am in everything that I do. There's no airs and graces. It was literally like, right, we can walk away from the hundred grand we've just put down. This was 15 years ago, mind. Um, we walk away from the hundred grand we've got to put down. We've got six months to go. But I've got a dream. You know, I've a field of dreams. And I had a dream that I could create something that's going to really shake up this world in the sport and mixing sport and business together and sport and music. And I was so passionate about my dream and so driven and, and so obsessed that the conversation flowed. There was lots of tears from my uh, fiance, but we agreed, let's go for it. Um, but anyone listening, do not remortgage your house to throw a festival. Trust me, because my beautiful wife now, for for been with her 18 years, and she's stuck by my side for the whole time. She gave up her job. She worked at JP Morgan. Yeah, you know, she had a nice corporate job, a million miles from my world. But you know, we're, we're we're poles apart on that side. But she gave up her job to come on board and and help me out, help me uh, put on this first festival. And um, yeah, it was a you know, Fleur, my wife, bless her, she was probably crying five nights a week in bed. She's not a risk taker. She's far yeah. from it. She's from a lovely little village in Wales, you know, and I'm, <laughs> she's, she, you know, she's, we're together and I'm, I'm a promoter who loves risk and is not worried about things and uh, bless her, absolutely bless her. Yeah, we managed to put the first festival on and, um, it was a it was a huge success. What were the what were the biggest successes and the biggest challenges within that first festival? The biggest challenges was letting people know about it. Cause I was going up to, you know, I was thinking sport and music festival, we needed rugby teams playing sevens rugby and netball teams. And you know, I was I was going down the rugby route and I went, the biggest challenges were letting people know about this thing in Bournemouth. Back then Bournemouth wasn't really a, a cool place to be. You know, back in the sort of uh, the 2000s, Bournemouth was where sort of your nan lived. You know, it's very different now. It's a real cool place to be, lovely university and, and lovely beaches. And But that was a challenge. But I also knew the location really helped the festival because they knew it was a stag and hen town or people grew up. They'd all go to Bournemouth. They didn't have money to go abroad. People all go to Bournemouth because it was a great fun night, loads of bars and restaurants and, and what have you. So the challenge was letting people know about it. And I would take four car loads of students up from Bournemouth all dressed in the girls dressed as super women outfit with the sort of boob tubes and the tight hot pants with a cape and a mask. And then all the boys would be dressing up in Superman's outfit. And I'll take a 80,000 flyers up in rucksacks and we'd go around just flying every single person about this new thing called Bournemouth sevens and being chased by security, hiding in the toilets and coming back out again and flying all the cars, windscreens. And it was great fun. But that's how we promoted it. It was full on guerrilla marketing. And um, they say guerrilla. They're talking about guerrilla marketing now. I didn't even know it's called guerrilla marketing. I just knew it was promoting. And, you know, and, and when promoting and you're handing flyers to people, you don't just hand a flyer and expect them to put it in their pocket and check it out on a website the following day. You, you, you've got to have a bit about you. A very quick bang, 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 bang. Next one, next one, next one. We call it nowadays elevator pitch, don't we? You've got yeah. 30 seconds between floors. Tell somebody what it is you do. and you're Absolutely. Telling this is the I'm telling people I'm telling people in five six seconds you know and 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 we that's what we were doing and we were fly posting and and boarding up places and places you shouldn't do you know in farmers fields and on lamp posts and wherever needed to be done I just had to do it I had to make this succeed because my house was on the line and when your house is on the line for something you will do things that maybe you normally wouldn't do like running away from security <laughs> at Twickenham. There's that. There's all the, that's a that's a my yeah. There's just yeah. You would you just needed to get the word out there. We'll leave it as that. 
Yeah, get, <laughs> get, get, get eyeballs where they need to be and make sure that they understand what the value of attending the festival was. Absolutely, absolutely. And good thing was is that your reputation does uh, go with you because people knew I know how to throw a good party, you know, and I didn't want to make it just a, the festival, just a sausage fest. So it was important. I got some a load of females there. So I said, well, let's bring netball on board to bring all the girls there. And we were the pioneer of bringing, combining those two sports, which a lot of people around the world are doing at the moment. And that was that was a game changer for us, bringing the girls netball in there as well, because um, it was just an extension. The festival was just an extension that if you went to uni and you grew up in that sporty lifestyle and you knew all night, went out on Wednesday and there was drinking games and there was fun, I wanted to bring that, my dream was to bring that into one big field with with a hundred DJs and bands and twelve festival arenas and big sponsors and and TV crews and BBC and Sky Sports and I would tell everyone that's what's going to happen before it even happened. I built up such a picture in people's mind that I had to follow through. <laughs> With like a swan on top and just flapping like anything underneath, you know, in all those all those early years, but. You know, if I say I was going to do so, I had to follow through, and that's what I did. And that's what we did, as you know. What about challenges in that first festival? Then, in particular, you you you, you rock up on the day. Um, everyone's paying cash, so yep. you must be pleased to see people turning up in their numbers. But what's the first day like in terms of making sure it all runs smoothly? Again, it was all the unknown. I didn't know how many people were going to turn up when you're building a festival site and you're putting all these marquees up everywhere, you're thinking, right, if they move around there, they're going to go into that first marquee, the big beer tent. Then they're going to go into the dance tent. Then will they go into the VIP tent? You don't know. You know, security are saying to me, Dodge, how many security do you want? How many people are you going to have? I was like, I don't know. Is it going to be 5,000? It'll be 6,000? It'll be 2,000? I don't know. You know, it was literally like that. So again, it was all the unknown. And, um, that was a challenge, you know, because security is saying, well, hold on a minute. I need to know that I'm bringing 50 or 60 men in your first event. Or, or for me, the challenge was, right, how many bar staff do I need? Do I need 50? Do I need 90? Do I need 100? Again, I didn't know. There was loads of challenges. You know, there was a challenge that, <laughs> there was a challenge, there was a challenge that I got a, the, the wonderful fun, fee, fun fair people there. And uh, we had this ride, because we're next to the airport, we had this ride called the reverse bungee. Yep. So you imagine two solid poles that are maybe 50 metres in the air. You go in a cage and they ping you up into the sky. You know, to add to all the pressure that we were under, financial pressure and just every bit of pressure going on in that first year, you know, making sure everyone's on site. And all of a sudden the police turn up and the airport police control turn up and like that, that ride there needs to come down, otherwise the planes are going to fly into it. And I was like, no, but it can't because it's part. They said, if you, if you don't take that ride down, we're going to close your festival. So I went to the lovely funfair person who had, had a, a lovely amount of uh, gold jewellery all on his hands and around his neck and uh, 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 tattoos and a couple of teeth and tried to tell him that he's, he's got to take this thing down where he thinks he's going to earn five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten grand from it. Um, that was a challenge. And uh, I was, he said, I want three grand. I was like, I haven't got three grand to give you. I'll give you 300 quid for your petrol. And, he, and this was a standoff. And I was like, mate, you have to leave this festival site. Otherwise, we can't open the festival. It was literally like that. It went on for about half an hour. And he was fuming. And I remember seeing him packing it all down. It took him like 45 minutes, putting it on his big low loader truck. And um, I thought, lovely, he's going to drive off now. And he didn't. And I was literally running around the festival site in and out of marquees. It was like the, the Benny Hill song, you know, did, 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 like hiding from him. <laughs> again, it was another challenge again, but these are all great stories. But, and these are all things that we learn, we learn from. And, you know, moving on 15 years, it's a very different story today. But yeah, it's, it's certainly a different story. Yeah. It's, it's scaled and scaled and scaled, Dodge. But what do you think are some of the lessons that people can take from the growth of the Bournemouth Sevens? Because it's, it, was a, it was a brilliant first year for you albeit I've heard you speak before that it wasn't massively profitable. It was a small margin of profit and you've had to scale that. What we you... made a grand. We made a thousand pounds profit in year one and we were so happy. 
a grand. I could do it with my eyes closed in one of the little nightclubs somewhere, you know. But you, but I knew I was building a brand. I knew I was building something for the future for for, for myself and my wife's livelihood and my boy's livelihood. And and when you when you are building something, you have to give it time. There's a lot of chat at the moment on the internet about these overnight successes, people driving around in a luminous green sports cars, sitting on an airbed in Dubai and saying they've just, looked, what a load of old tosh, people are falling into it. If you're going to build something, you build solid foundations. And for me, I was a very big firm believer of building a brand. And when you build a brand that has longevity, you can build a business that can be taken away from overnight. If you build a brand, you will have longevity. And we've gone through all sorts of ups and downs over the last 15 years, but the brand has been so strong. But my, I guess anyone listening out there is, if you want to make something successful, you have to be obsessed. And I was obsessed with making this work for a number of reasons, the financial reasons and uh, respect reasons, reputation reasons. Um, and I wanted to be the pioneer of something super successful. But you've got to live something 24-7. You have to live same 24 seven. And going back to that thousand pound there, Colin, you know, people listening may go, is that all a grand? Melvin Ben is one of the, he owns Reading Festival and Leeds Festival and Festival Republic. He's one of the big guns, 60 odd years old, been there, done it, got the t-shirt. He came down and said to me, Dodge, sport and music festivals, I don't know, but music festivals take seven years to break even. He said to me, do not change a thing that you're doing. And they were really lovely words to hear. And um, I th when I told him we made a grand, he was uh, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. Literally couldn't one, believe it. Unheard in of. year one, yeah. in heard of, unheard of, unheard of. Um, then I knew I was onto something. I was going to say, but, you knew you had the foundations for it to become highly profitable, but also really valuable because if you if consumers vote with their money for you to be profitable in year one and you know there's so many things that you could do better and you have done over the last 15 years to build it to the the institution the kind of event on the calendar that people circle now yeah it's it, there's a lot of promise there isn't it yeah yeah you've got to build a lot of trust you know and and what i've done over the last 23 years of throwing parties is create wonderful experiences for people people will always remember how you made them feel. My mum always taught me that from a young kid. People will always remember how you made them feel, you know? And that's, she's a wise lady and, and that is very, very true. If you create a great experience for someone that they go there, the first person meets them in security and they're happy and bubbly and fun and you, you, you give great music and great entertainment and, and lots of color and a great vibe. And you're giving off that from the top as the, as the owner, that's only going to trickle down to everyone. And we've created an amazing vibe at the festival. And um, again, it comes down to that experience, good food, good quality beer, good fun, good entertainment, lighthearted people dancing with each other, people who you've never met. They might come from Glasgow. They might come from, Cardiff, they're coming from all in, all, all, all over the place of the UK or they're flying in from different countries to come to your festival. They're all leaving and telling 10 people face to face. They're all leaving, putting it up on their social media, which goes out to a thousand of their friends or maybe 20,000 of the people following them. It just trickles very, very quickly, you know? Yeah. You started the Bournemouth Sevens in 2008 when the world flipped upside down with the, the crash, the financial challenges. And then in the start of 2020, when the world also went mad again with the start of the pandemic, you decided that it's time to start a personal brand. And you hinted towards that at the start of the discussion when we were speaking. And you opened up on all these stories and things that you've done over the years that you'd maybe told people in person, but you hadn't recorded it before. But yep. then you started recording it. You started having amazing, interesting, curious conversations with guests what was it like to go from somebody that had quite a private life to somebody who was maybe putting himself out there online for the first time? Yeah, it was weird. It was weird. But I lost my festival in 2020 due to the pandemic. And I was thinking, shit, I need to think of a new business here that's pandemic proof. Um, and I come up with the idea of, of creating an online events course. 
um, which we have launched this week. So we spent 22 months working on this. And it's called theeventcrowd.com. And it's basically where I brought 40 of the leading industry experts in to do guest lectures um, of people from the Olympics, from uh, Glastonbury, from all the big events around the UK. And I just saw a huge gap in the market to, to bring something new and online where people can do this in their boxer shorts and, and, and become so skilled that they can get into the events industry. And it's the events, it's the industry that I love but there's been no access for people to get in the events industry, but now we have it. So we've created this wonderful course, a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time of doing an events management degree. Um, and it gets you diplomas, but yeah, that the idea was to create a business. But before that we had to create a personal brand. I was told, I kept hearing this personal brand thing, personal brand dodge. I was like, Jesus, really? Anyway, I went for it and uh, I told my story on, a podcast it went viral people loved the story and created the eventful entrepreneur podcast where i've told four or five of my stories on the different episodes we're now 71 72 episodes in and it, it's in the top 0.5 percent of podcast global now so we're doing something right and i think it's just because it's real it's real people whether you're a top entrepreneur whether you are a sporting icon whether you're a celebrity whether you're a rock star whether you're an ex-gangster whether you are uh, a top businessman, whatever it is, it's real life stories. And, and I delve deep into people, you know, and uh, cause I'm curious and yeah, over the last 18 months, uh, creating the Instagram account uh, under Dodge Woodall and the podcast and on LinkedIn, it's just gone, it's gone bonkers if I'm honest with you, Colin, it really has. How did it feel to get asked to be the co-host on the High Rednut podcast? That kind of came out, <laughs> did it come out of nowhere for you? That came out of nowhere. I was only eight episodes in onto my own podcast. That's eight weeks. And it was one Sunday night, I got a phone call and uh, a random number on my mobile. And he said, is that Dodge? And I was like, yeah. He said, uh, my name is, da, 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 da. I'm the executive producer of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. I thought someone was on a wind up. You know, like my best mate on a wind up or something. And uh, he said, Can I come and see you? I was like, Sure. So him and his right hand man drove down to Bournemouth the following day and said, We love your podcast. We love how raw it is and, and your story. Would you like to co host this new podcast? I was like, Yeah, what is it? He went, It's the Harry Redknapp show. And I was like, <laughs> Where do I sign? I'm in. You know, so that was, that was bonkers as well. So I signed the contract there for the, for the series one and the following day I was interviewing Piers Morgan with Harry, me, Harry interviewing Piers Morgan and me and Harry were kicking each other under the table, like two kids, like laughing, going, what are we doing here? Like two, two London lads done all right for themselves interviewing the biggest interviewer in the world, you know? Um, and then the following week it was me and Harry and Rod Stewart. And then it was Frank Lampard. And then it was, Jamie Redknapp, and then it was, the list just went on and on and on, and um, we had a we had a proper laugh, a proper laugh, and it was just all a lot of fun, a lot of stories. You said something really interesting earlier, and I put a bit of a pen in it, in it mentally. I wanted to bring it back up before we finished. You spoke about online seeing a lot of people with this instant gratification lifestyle. So somebody showing the the fancy sports car, maybe they're talking about forex or trading or something like that, and they're always on holiday in Dubai on yachts and whatnot. But one of the reasons that I think is a, a clear thread throughout your life is that a lot of your success has come from areas where you've got time under tension, experience built over and over again. And it just so happened that when you turned the mic on, people weren't about the skill set that you had from years and years of conversations in business. And people would maybe be like, oh, an overnight success, eight episodes in, and you're now being invited to go and host another podcast with Harry Bloody Redknapp. Yeah. But ultimately, you had hours and years of experience having brilliant conversations with people, being curious, asking questions, giving your little anecdotes and stories of which you've got hundreds. I mean, we didn't even delve any further about the monkey and the parrot that you had in your family home. <laughs> but there's, lots of, there's, there's lots of places we could have gone, Dodge. So I find yeah. it very important that in this era of instant gratification and quick routes to success, that despite maybe somebody who would look at a headline such as you eight episodes in getting appointed to the, the Harry Redknapp show, 
there's so much in behind it that enabled that to be possible. Absolutely. And the biggest one is graft. If you want to be a success in anything, you have got to put in the shift. You've got to put in the graft. And I'm not sure. I just think with the instant gratification these days, I think that maybe the graft has gone out a little bit of sort of real businesses. You know, there's a, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you think- Hard graft cannot be beaten, honestly. It really cannot be beaten. And, you, and if you want to be successful, I said it earlier in the podcast, you have to be obsessed. <clears throat> you have to think about it 24-7. You have to go to bed thinking about it and wake up thinking about it. Because every time you're thinking about it and, and every day you're adding to your brand, whether it's your personal brand, whether it's your Bournemouth Sevens Festival, whether it's the event crowd, whether it's the Eventful Entrepreneur podcast or whatever you're doing, you've got to be thinking about it the whole time. You know, and if you're improving 1% each day and you've put in 4,000 days, you're only going to be a success. Yeah, exactly that. And I think looking at your history, your past and your future in terms of where you're heading, Dodge, that's certainly mm. something that's very, very powerful. Now, you said your mum imparted a lot of wisdom on you. I think that's clear when you spoke about pound a man, win-win situation. Were there any other areas that you think she taught you? Because I, I saw your really heartfelt post and I was very pleased to see you put something like that out there um, off the back of a, a, a personal uh, challenge. But what else would you want to share in terms of wisdom that she gave you, Dodge, that shaped the man that we have got to have a conversation with for the last hour? Yeah, yeah, just wise. My mum and dad are just wise. They're just wise. They're not educated. You don't have to be educated to be to be wise and be bang on the ball. There's just a lot of wisdom in our family and, it, and, and it's lovely. <clears throat> and there are real people. They're real. They're entrepreneurs, you know, from Manchester and East London. And it's a nice combo that I've got lovely parents who I choose to call my mum and dad, you know. And there's not many people who would want to interview your mum separately and your dad separately on your podcast or my, my own podcast. And I wanted to interview them because their stories are amazing. You know, and um, huge respect. And like I said before, having that gift of being given belief and encouragement and freedom as a kid. You know, as a kid, I wasn't going to bed at 7 a.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m. I was going to bed at 11 o'clock, midnight, every night. And they had a nightclub next door banging music out till 2, 3 in the morning. Come on, Eileen. Did, you know, sleep patterns were gone. But looking back, I wouldn't choose to put have a kid, my little boy, and get him to live above a pub. I wouldn't. But, because we knew, didn't know any different, I loved it. I was seeing so many things the whole time, and it, it, it makes you the man you are today, you know? And, um, but yeah, they're solid. My old man's solid. My dad's solid, and uh, he's taught me wonderful, he's gave me wonderful gifts as well. And he, he's the rock, you know? He's a proper gentleman, and... He's a hard man, but also a very soft man as well, which is lovely. I love that, Dodge, and they've certainly created a, a, a brilliant guy in yourself, and I'm sure the listeners will want to continue the conversation with you. If they would like to do so, Dodge, where should they head towards? Just get me on Instagram, Dodge Woodall, um, and I'm big on LinkedIn as well. I, I really enjoy that platform, but if you want to hear some more stories, I guess, listen to episodes one, four, and seven of, of the Event for Entrepreneur podcast, where uh, I get interviewed. And there's, there's a load of stories in there as well, court cases and everything thrown in the mix. Yes, well, that, <laughs> uh, that, that 70 grand middleman in China was a story. I <laughs> as well. But I'll, 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 I'll implore the listeners to go and listen to that on your podcast. Absolutely. Course. We didn't even talk about the sportswear brand, did we? No, I know, but again, <laughs> it shows everything you've been up to over, over, yeah. over this period. Um, yeah. I've absolutely loved that. The, show, the link in the show notes, guys, will be linked Dodge's LinkedIn, Dodge's Instagram, and where you can listen to the Eventful Entrepreneur podcast. I've absolutely loved this conversation. I'm sure you have as well. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a screenshot, pop it on your Instagram story, tag me at call.cambro, tag Dodge, and I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon. <laughs>